Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we come today to rejoice and to praise you, to honor you and glorify your holy name. We thank you we come in celebration in this Advent season. And we ask, Lord, that you would move in power in our midst today, that you would speak to us, that, Lord, you would let me get out of the way that you might speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. This morning is the fourth week of Advent and the, the prelude to the Christmas season. Now, week one, I said that Advent speaks of the three comings of Christ. The first one is when, as he comes as a child born in Bethlehem. And the second is as he comes into our hearts every day. And, and thirdly, at the end of time, he comes to be with us forever as King of kings and Lord of lords. And so far, we've seen how God has shown himself faithful by coming the first time. And this should give us the confidence that we need to believe that he'll come again. We've seen that Israel called upon God to come to their rescue because they knew that he was their shepherd. He knew that they knew that he was their potter, that he had made them, that he, he cared for them, and that he forgave them time and again. They prayed with confidence in the fact of who they knew God was and the fact that he never changes. Last week we looked at the promise of God to those who would willingly follow him that they were going to inherit the new heavens and the new earth, something that we look forward to, we long for, because all things will be restored. And all those who inherit that will live under the blessing and the glory and the promises that God has made to us, that we will live in his presence forever. I want that above all things. Amen? Amen. All those who inherit that will be those who have everything fulfilled they've looked, looked forward to. And we, and we saw the perfect example of that last week in the story of John the Baptist that he knew who Jesus was, that it was God come in the flesh, that he had come to usher in the kingdom of God here upon earth. It was in this realization that he was able to declare, he must increase and I must decrease. So this week we're going to focus on what is commonly called the Annunciation, the announcement of the incarnation by the angel to the Virgin Mary. Now, the Feast of Annunciation is traditionally celebrated on March 25th. But I bring it up today because it is our gospel passage, but also March 25th to to December 25th is nine months. Pretty cool, huh? (laughs) For those who've had babies, you go, oh. You know, when writing a story, the author often reveals as much in the details of the story than the main story itself. Sometimes it's simply a matter of uh, even proper pronunciation that can, it conveys a meaning. For example, the sentence, let's go and eat grandma, is changed dramatically if we place a comma between eat and grandma. Instead of an invitation to cannibalism, it's a nice kind of invitation to have dinner with your grandmother. Let's go eat, grandma. Details can be very important. When you're looking for a deeper understanding of the meaning of of God's Word, it's sometimes in the details that you find God speaking most clearly to you, giving you the most hope. When studying the Scriptures, there's a consideration of what is called the meta-narrative. We've talked about this before, which is simply a a fancy way of saying the overall overarching theme of of the story. I've told you before that I believe that the meta narrative of the scriptures is the kingdom of God, that the overarching theme of all of scripture is the kingdom of God. However, within the Bible, there are many thousands of stories and lessons that help us understand God's intention and plan in bringing the kingdom of God from heaven to earth. When we understand the meta narrative, it changes the focus of those stories from being just random stories to intentional storytelling that is directing us to a common theme. In other words, 
when you know the overall theme of the story, then each lesson and individual stories can be seen in light of that theme. And many of these lessons teach us kingdom principles. And the themes help us to know what it is to to understand God and his, his character and his nature and even how it is we are to respond to God and to each other. We find that there are stories within stories in the Bible. And each of us can pro- probably remember times where you've read a verse or a section of verses many, many times, and, but suddenly a new understanding of a part of that verse has an aha moment. And now you understand it more clearly. And sometimes it's a matter of, of just learning what a, a word means, not in the, our context, but what it would have meant to the ancient writers. And suddenly it changes everything. That's why it is we should be students of the Scriptures, that we should be studying the Word of God, because it continually unfolds for us, declaring who God is and what it means to live in His kingdom. I want to begin this morning, I want to begin by laying this out, because I believe in our Gospel reading from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, the details within the story itself add a richness and a depth to the story. I suspect that everyone here is familiar with the story of of the angel Gabriel coming to Mary announcing that she will give birth to a child who will be the son of the living God. But it's the smaller details of the story that, that give us hope and make it come alive in our own hearts. First, I believe it'd be helpful to go back to the first part of the chapter in chapter one, where God sends the angel Gabriel to Zechariah, her priest, who's of the division of Abijah. He's serving in the temple. He's burning incense in the temple, and suddenly Gabriel appears to him. Listen to the words of the angel and his reaction. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. Now you'll remember that the John referred to here is John the Baptist, and Zechariah is to be his father, and Elizabeth, who is a relative of Mary, the Virgin Mary, is going to be his mother. And one of the important details of this story is that Zechariah and Elizabeth are very old and they're well past childbearing age. And Gabriel had come to announce that Elizabeth, who was barren, would give birth to a child, which was a totally unexpected miracle. Their son would be the forerunner of the Messiah, the one that we've been reading about during Advent from Isaiah 40, the one who would prepare a way of the Lord to make the path straight, the one that God was going to use for that. And God was fulfilling this promise by giving a child to a man and woman who had been barren and and had prayed for years that God would give them a child. In their culture, it was a shame to not, it was actually considered shame to not have a child, that somehow God had not blessed you. But how kind and loving our God is to choose this man and this woman to be part of the plan for the coming of the Messiah. He could have chosen anyone because, frankly, the primary focus is going to end up being on the child who's, who announces the, the coming of, of the Messiah. But God had a plan within a plan in mind. And it would include showing kindness to those who would normally be incidental to the story. That's how our God is. And Gabriel continued telling Zechariah who this child was going to be. And his reaction was not one of gratefulness and amazement, but, but doubt. And so he responds, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. I love the angel's answer. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. The fact that Zechariah was troubled and afraid, I believe that's probably sort of normal. 
Most every time we read in the Bible that an angel appears, the person to whom they appear usually falls flat on their face in fear. And the angel always has to say the same thing, don't be afraid, indicating there's some reason to be afraid. The angels are the ones who continually fight the demons of the, of the kingdom of darkness. They're valiant warriors, and they're probably mighty in stature. They're not little cherubs that you see in Raphael's paintings, like Cupid. That's not what they look like. But the point is, if an angel shows up and gives you the assurance that he did not come to destroy you, that the next thing he says should be something that you believe. Because this angel is sent from God, the creator of the universe, and one who is unlimited in power and ability. And you would assume that a priest would be in awe and wonder at such a thing and would be praising God by the good news brought by the angel. But instead, Zechariah can't see that what the angel is promising has any, any human way to happen. Not even humanly possible, and he's right. But it wasn't a human who was making the promise. It was, it was God. And so he's given a lesson on the cost of doubting God. But because God is rich in mercy, he still will be given a son. I think this is an important detail within the story because it shows us the character and the nature of our God and King. Let's turn our focus now on our gospel reading this morning from Luke 1 and read verses 26 to 33. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, this story happens six months after the, the angel Gabriel has come to, to Zechariah, but it's still the, the same angel that's bringing this good news to Mary. And there are several details in this story, I believe, give it much deeper meaning. The first is that God chose a young girl from Nazareth, which is a city in Galilee, there is no reference in the Old Testament to Nazareth. And the only time you're going to read about Nazareth is in the Gospels and Acts referring to Jesus of Nazareth because it's where he grew up. He was referred to as Jesus of Nazareth, and the Jews knew that there were no prophecies that were foretelling that a prophet would come out of any part of Galilee. John 7, 52 records the Pharisees chastising Nicodemus for defending Jesus. They said, look into it. You'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. And so God sends, sends an angel to a very young girl who is from a region that was held in, in contempt by the Sanhedrin because it was an area where Jews had intermarried with other nations. And they were not zealous about, of the law, according to the Pharisees. So the Jews weren't merely, weren't merely saying that that no prophet would come out of, out of Galilee. They were saying no prophet would ever come out of Galilee. God would not do such a thing from such a disreputable place. But even though Jesus was actually born in Bethlehem, he was called Jesus of Nazareth because he lived there. He grew up there. I mean, Nazareth is in the general region of Galilee, but it's 15 miles from the Sea of Galilee. It's a long walk or a ride on a donkey. Either way, 15 miles is a long way. But it's also six miles from the closest major road. And there was no good water supply. There was one fairly weak well in the center of town. It was not a good place to be from. And yet God chose to find the mother of our Lord there. It seems to me fitting since the Messiah would be from the line of David. 
and was set upon his throne eternally. If you look in 1 Samuel 16, it tells the story of God sending Samuel to anoint one who was to be the king of Israel to replace King Saul. And he sends him to Bethlehem, the smallest town in the tribe of Judah. And he sends him to the most, the least of the families in that town. And he chooses the least, the youngest son, who was a shepherd, which was an occupation that had no, no one respected it. It was the least occupation that there was in that culture. Could it be that God is sending us the, the message that he can raise up the lowest of the low to accomplish all of his holy will? Perhaps it isn't about us being great or powerful, but about the God who is. And secondly, God chose a young girl who was betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And there were, as we've talked about before, there are three stages in the Jewish ritual during that time. First, there was the engagement, which was the formal greeting between the fathers, between the families. And then there was the betrothal, which was a formal agreement where mutual promises were made and the bride price was paid to the bride of the father. I mean, the father of the bride. The young girl could become betrothed between the age, anytime after the age of 12, but once she was betrothed, it was a done deal. She was legally married, and now she could be called the wife of the groom. And approximately one year later, the marriage would take place when the bridegroom would show up, usually unexpectedly. Never really figured that one out. But when a couple was betrothed, they were under the obligation of faithfulness. And divorce was required to break the betrothal. This was not a casual promise. And so this is the situation that Gabriel comes into with Mary. Saying, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. You'll notice that Luke doesn't record that she's afraid, but only troubled at such a greeting. I mean, imagine a 12 to 14 year old girl being addressed by an angel telling her she's the favored one, and the Lord is with her. I suspect that her, her humility prevented her from understanding this greeting, and probably she's just thinking, what in the world is he talking about? She doesn't seem to fear the angel, though. But he still encourages her not to fear. And I think it's because what he's about to say to her is going to change everything in her life. It's going to cause her a lot of trouble. And I think it's also because he knows that she is betrothed and what it's going to mean that she's betrothed. He was telling her that she was going to give birth to the Son of the Most High God, the long-awaited Messiah who would eternally reign on David's throne. And she has to, if she's thinking about at that point at all, she has to be thinking, who's going to believe that story? When I'm with child, no one's going to believe, well, it's okay because I'm pregnant with the, with the Son of God, the child of the Most High God. And I go, oh, well, if that's what's going on. She knew that wasn't, that wasn't going to happen. And perhaps, unlike Zechariah, she assumed that whenever an angel comes to you and says something like that, that... If it's from God, he can work out the details. Her response, however, shows her immediate concern. Let's read Luke 1, 34 to 38. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I mean, Zechariah and Mary both question what Gabriel was telling them. But with Zechariah, it was due to the skepticism that such a thing could even happen. Whereas with Mary, it's wondering how he was going to bring this about. 
since she was a virgin. I think Gabriel could discern from unbelief and curiosity. And so he tells her what will happen. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon her and the power of the Most High is going to overshadow her. And this is the same concept. The word here used to overshadow it means to cover with a cloud. It's like the Shekinah glory that came upon Israel and they followed the cloud of God's presence the whole time they're in the wilderness. And it's like the cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration when Moses and Elijah are standing there with Jesus and Peter, James, and John see the glory of God, the presence of God enveloping the mountain. It was that kind of glory, it was that kind of overshadowing that was going to come upon this young girl. This cloud was a visible manifestation of the glory and the presence of God. This means that the same power of God that came upon Moses and the others in the Old Testament was going to be, do a unique work in this young girl, Mary. Brother, I'm here to tell you, if we will allow the Holy Spirit to come upon us, then God will do a unique work in us as well. To encourage her faith that God is doing a mighty work, Gabriel tells her about her relative Elizabeth, that Mary knows her age. He says, Mary, I want you to believe that God's going to do this, and the way you're going you're to begin to believe that is even Elizabeth, your cousin, your relative, is six months pregnant because nothing is impossible with God. And what God had done with Zechariah and Elizabeth was amazing, but it was nothing in comparison to what God was prepared to do with this young girl. For a virgin to become pregnant would require an act of God, and that's exactly what happened. Mary's response has been the subject of, of books and long conversations for a long time because, see, she doesn't ask the angel to give her a little time to think about it. Or she doesn't say to him, well, let me give you some reasons why I think you ought to look for someone else. Instead, she simply says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. Lord God, if you have said this, I will do it. Consider the situation that Mary found herself in. She was a simple young woman from an unimpressive family in a very outgoing town. She was already betrothed to someone. A very common man, a widower and a carpenter. All these things were common and ordinary. Nothing spectacular, but it was normal life to her, and it's what she had planned on. And suddenly God comes upon her, and she finds out that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her, and she will become pregnant with the Son of the Most High God. That's some pretty big news, don't you think? In essence, her betrothal is changed from Joseph to God. And the community around her will not know that. Not for a long time. But her allegiance now is to God. And she would later find out that the father of the son that she gave birth to would himself pay a very high price for this to happen. And so her commitment was to faithfulness and her betrothal to Joseph was still going to be honored. But God was saying... What I'm asking you to do, what I'm telling you today, this too is not a casual agreement. It changes everything. She had not asked for this. She had not sought this role in God's plan. It was God who had intruded into her life and brought her into the plan for the Messiah, the Savior of the world. She couldn't fully understand what was going to happen. But as you read the story, you'll, you'll see that she was found faithful. And that's what God wanted from her. God was going to do what only God could do. It required, however, she be faithful. I love this story, and ones like it, where ordinary, common people are raised up by God. 
and they're anointed to live out extraordinary lives to the glory of God. If you look back throughout the Word of God, you'll find the, the superstars of our faith were simply ordinary men and women that God raised up out of common lives and empowered to accomplish the miraculous. When God first came to Moses, he was an 80-year-old man who was not successful by anybody's standards. As a matter of fact, he was a fugitive from Egypt for murder, and he was attending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, a Midianite. He's a shepherd, the lowest job. He's 80 years old, and this is not even his flock. And yet God comes to him. The fact that he became the deliverer of Israel to bring them out of slavery to Egypt, and the one through whom the law was given is because God acted. God used a man who have, of no real reputation and made him a... a a cornerstone for the nation of Israel. Exodus 33, 11 says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Have you ever longed for that? Why would God do that? I think there's two reasons. First of all, because he wanted to. And the second reason is because Moses was willing to follow his commands. Today's story, an angel approaches a very common young girl from a very impress, unimpressive town and raises her up to be the mother of our Lord. That was over 2,000 years ago. And she's still remembered and revered by hundreds of millions of people today. Is it because she was great and powerful? No, it was because she trusted God enough to do what he asked, and he did the rest. Today, God, through his word and spirit, is still asking us to be faithful, to do what he has asked us to do, to spread the good news of the gospel to everyone, everywhere, to be the face and the hands and feet of Christ to those everywhere. It begins here at home. And it begins when we simply say to him, Lord, use me in whatever way that you want. Or in the words of Mary, the mother of Jesus, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. This season is a reminder that God has given us his word and asked us to trust him by obedience to do the miraculous. Brethren, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that we need the miraculous. We need God intervening on our behalf, on behalf of our nation and of our world. And it will happen when those who are obedient said, let it be done to me according to your word. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you today as those who for the most part, have made commitments to you and ask you to be our God and our King. And Lord, I pray that you would take us even deeper. That Lord, we would be those who are willing to trust you to do those things in us that we could never conceive of, to raise us up to a level of obedience and faith that we see you move in us in extraordinary ways. God, our nation needs your people to stand up and say, let it be done to me according to your word. Let us be that people, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.